Okay, we will start. It is uh, 9.32, so, uh, I think, yeah. So um, let's get started. Uh, today is the 40th day counting the Omer up to uh, Shavuot. And uh, next week we'll talk a little bit about Shavuot and um, how that's celebrated. Uh, it'll be 10 days from now. Uh, so it's a week from Thursday is Pentecost or Shavuot. And since it is the 40th day, I went online and this is the um, part of scripture that they use on the 40th day. So it's from Psalm 119. So I thought it'd be a great way to start our day. And actually, we're going to be learning the same letter that this starts in today. So I just thought, oh my gosh, look, it's the pay. So I'm going to read it to us uh, and then pray today. So just let the Lord speak to you. This is Psalm 119, 129. Your instruction is a wonder. This is why I follow it. Your words are a doorway that lets in light, giving understanding to the thoughtless. My mouth is wide open as I pant with longing for your mitzvot. Turn to me and show me your favor in keeping with your judgment for those who love your name. Guide my footsteps in your word. Don't let any kind of sin rule me. Redeem me from human oppression and I will observe your precepts. Make your face Shine on your servant and teach me your Torah. Rivers of tears flow down my eyes because they don't observe your Torah. You are righteous, Adonai, and your rulings are upright. You have commanded your instructions in righteousness and great faithfulness. Amen. Lord, we love your word. Make it on top after it's, you know. Oops. Okay. Is everybody muted? Let's pray. Lord, we take this time today. We dedicate it to you, Abba. You are such a good, faithful daddy. We can lean on you no matter what is happening in our lives. Thank you that you're teaching us your ways, your mitzvot, um, to follow Jesus more fully and completely with a heart that loves and devoted and is devoted to you, Lord. So uh, use this time to bless all of us as we attempt to understand you and go deeper into your word. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen, amen. So today, let me share the screen and we'll get started. I have some fun things to share with you today. And let me move some of this stuff out of the way here. You may hear my grandchildren in the background, and also, of course, today they're cutting down a tree with buzz saws next door. So you may be hearing some buzzing in the background. So today we are going to learn our letters Samic, Ayan, Pei, and Saadi. And uh, it's I'm going to run through it quickly because there's a lot I want to share today, and we only have one more class. Normally, I teach this in seven or eight weeks, so I'm jamming everything into, you know, six. So bear with me if I hurry through some of this um, teaching. But let's start first with review. I think that's always fun and always good to review. So let's look at these letters together. Um, and why don't you unmute everybody, uh, Betsy? and let people who maybe have taken this class before, let the other new people name their letters. So uh, what is this letter? Gallet. Gallet. And this Gosh. one? This is a what? Carby, you, you can answer. Final mem. That's a final mem. Or a mem so feet. Okay, what's this one? Bet. Bet. Very good. How about this one? This one's a little tricky. That's a final form of what letter? Cough. Very good. The cough. And so let's say this first word. Pronounce this, somebody. 
Dalit. Dom. Dom. Uh huh. And how about this one? If this is the kof, final kof, k sound, say this. Buck. Very good. And how about this letter? Yod. Yod. Dalit. What's this vowel? Okay. Uh, so say this word. Yod. Very good. A yod. A yod is a hand. All right. How about this letter? M. 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 Another ah. And what's this one? Lamed. 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 The long, long letter. That's how you remember that. So pronounce this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. and another Lamed. What's this mm -hmm. one? Het. <laughs> Very good. You got to get the throat sound. Het. <laughs> and this one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm so mem mm -hmm. so feet. Very good. Now say this word. There are two E sounds. F as in better. Lechem. Very good. Lechem. Lechem is bread. Look at you read Hebrew, you cute little people. All right, what about this one? What's this one? How the whole is made. And how about this one without the dot? That and Lamed. So these two are the S sound. And so say this word. Very good. And Hevel, Hevel in Hebrew is vanity. So when they say, who's making noise on their desk? <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, Hevel, this is a vanity, vanity that you see uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes, and he says, Hevel, Hevel. So you're reading Hebrew. Look at you. All right, what's this? And this is a E, A. a so say these, these words. Lay, lay that. Label. label. Lavav. 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 Lavav is a root of the word heart. So this is, means heart. What's this one? Bet. 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 And this is the what? Bob. No, it looks like a bob, but if you notice, it goes below the line. It's a long. Bang. Bang. So that's a final. That's a final oh, And so this is an E sound. So what is this word? Ben. Ben. And that means son in Hebrew. Ben. Okay, how about this one? What's this vowel? That's the oo sound. That's the oo. Okay. So this is a noon and a noon so feet. So say this word. Noon. 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 Very good. How about this one? What's that letter? Aleph. Aleph. Bet. Bet. And, and A. A. And we have two A sounds here. A and A, basically. A. A. The B. This is a B. So A. 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 Abba, Abba. Abba. Or Abba. Abba father. <laughs> How about this one? What's this vowel at the top? O. O. Dot on top is O. And what's this letter? M. 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 So it's an M. Remember, M is like mouse trap. Here's a little mouse going in. And this letter is what? Gimel. 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 What's this one? The no. Sophie. No. The new Sophie. No. Very good. Say this word. Okay. Mogan. 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 Very good. And Mogan is a what, Harvey? A shield. So there you go. 
Mogan <laughs> David. You've heard of Mogan David wine. Well, this yeah. is the word. <laughs> This is Mogan, and it means shield in Hebrew. Mogan baby, this one. Yeah. So how about this one? What's this right here? What's what uh, vowel is this one? The U. Okay, very good. It's 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 the Bob with the little dot in his stomach, and he's saying ooh. Okay. Oh. This is moo, and then what's this final? Cough. Noon. 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 Yeah. Noon. So pronounce this word. Noon. Moon. Very good. Moon. Okay. How about this one? This is a little longer. We have Alan. Alan. Tim. And Hay. Hay. Okay. And these are all A's down here. So pronounce this. Adam. Uh, Adam. Very good. Adama. And this is Adama. Earth in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. What is moon? Is it it's not moon, is it? No. Oh. We're, we're going to get to that. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Adama is the earth, or we're made out of the ground. And that's Adama. Mm -hmm. Now, these are real Hebrew words or names. What's this? Whose name is this? The, um, da, da, uh, da, David, 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 da, 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 Remember, this is E da, as in ink. This is the e. I, but it's pronounced ink, like ink or machine. So this is David, and that's King David. Okay, how about this one? Arun, very good. I don't know who said that. I did. Who's I did? I'm Catherine. <laughs> oh, Catherine. Hi. I don't have everybody's picture on my screen right now. <laughs> um, okay, so you haven't learned this letter yet. It's the resh. So I just put an R in front of it or on top of it. So whose name is this? Abraham. 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 Look at you reading your Hebrew. <laughs> something. Abraham. Adonai, David, Mogen, Adama. See how you're learning so quickly? This is just your fifth week. All right, so let's look at this one. What's this letter? Oh, yeah. It's a cough, and this is, this is also a cough, but it's a softer sound. But what's this letter? They all look alike, don't they? They do. That's it. That's bet. the bet, because remember it has, the bet has a back porch. You see this little thing coming out. That's how it's different. So this is a O on top. Dot on top is O. So how do you pronounce it? Kovad. Kovad? This isn't a V. This is a K sound. Two Ks and a V. Okay. Kokov is a star. Oh, there's your star word right there. Mm -hmm. How about this one? What is this? These two dots yeah. down here called? Uh, Shiva. Shiva. That's the Shiva. Shiva. Yeah, right. That's the Shiva. Uh, uh, S sound. It has an S sound, kind of like an E H. So this oh. is La Va. Uh. Noon. Noon. Good. Levana is moon. Levana is moon. And you get, it also means white. And Laban is in here. See Laban's name? Uh -huh. And when I went to Israel, I wrote on a white camel. I said, I want the white one. And he goes, her name is Labona. Do you know what that means? I said, yes, it means white or moon. And he, he couldn't believe it. And I just, he said, well, I'm, I'm studying Hebrew. So anyway, I got to ride Labona, the camel. So very good. That was good practice, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, let's move on today. I wanted to 
briefly, we went over some of the dialects in Judaism, but I wanted to make sure everybody understood the different um, sects or types of Judaism. Uh, when you say he's a Jewish person, uh, mm -hmm. they're not all the same. They don't all believe the same. So you need to know that different groups believe different things and um, give uh, weight to different books, uh, etc. So in Orthodox or Rabbinic Judaism, um, they're usually the ones that eat kosher, that uh, on Sabbath, they will walk, they won't drive, they study Torah, they also include the Talmud in their studying. And then the next group, kind of middle of the road, is a conservative Jew, and they they follow a lot of the traditional holidays. They're more moderate in their thinking, and they do all the holidays and feasts, etc., and study Torah. And I believe the Talmud also. Harvey, if I'm wrong, at the end of this, you, you share with me something different. Um, Reformed are the more liberal, progressive Jewish people. Um, our temple here in Encinitas, Temple Solel, is a Reformed synagogue. And uh, they, do, they focus a lot on community service and good deeds and, and mitzvot and that kind of a thing. Um, and then there's some subgroups. The Karite Jew is Orthodox, but they only use the Torah. They don't believe in studying from the oral law, the Talmud. So um, Nehemia Gordon is a, a, one of the men I follow online. He's a good teacher. Uh, he's a Karite Jew. Uh, he's not a Messianic Jew, but he teaches with a black pastor from Texas who... Uh, mm -hmm is a Methodist. So it's really fun to see them teach together and, and, um, and they both learn from each other. And of course, we're all praying that Nehemia Gordon comes to know the Messiah. Uh, but anyway, the Hasidic Jews are the ultra-Orthodox Jews. You'll see um, the Chabad uh, synagogue are Hasidic, ultra-Orthodox. Um, you'll see them in Israel with the black hats in the uh, long black outfits. Um, and then you have the Kabbalists. These are the mystics, mm. esoteric. Um, and it, it really depends on where they are. Some, some in Europe practice one thing, some in the United States practice different things. So it really is a conglomeration of beliefs and, and um, traditions. So just so you know that you can't just lump everybody under Judaism. Okay? I also, when I was over in Israel, I said, Harvey, what are those little side curls all about? <laughs> and what mm -hmm. these are called are peos or peyot. Um, mm -hmm. It's the injunction against shaving the sides of the hair. That's the word peyot here. And it's found in Leviticus 19.27. And it said, you shall not round off the peyot or the side of your head or the beard. Um, they can trim the beard, but they have to leave these little hair things curly. Some are curly, some are straight. Um, some rabbis have even said, and these are probably the mystics, that it symbolizes the separation between the front part of the brain, which is your intuitive self, from the back side of the brain, the physical self. And I read that online. I'm like, I bet you they're mystics. Uh, anyway, have you seen that syn uh, synagogue in La Costa called Chabad there? Mm -hmm. Right in La Costa yeah. El Camino Real. Mm -hmm. This is the Orthodox and Hasidic Judaism right on that corner. And I wanted to show you what the word Chabad means. It's really a, um, an acronym for three words. Chabad, here's how it's spelled. What are these letters? Uh, hey. Het. Het. Hey. Hey. Oh, hey. There's no hole here, so it's a okay. het, bet, bet. And Dalit. Very good. Very good. So we pronounce it Chabad. And this Chet stands for the word wisdom. And you'll see Chochma, it starts with this letter Chet for Chabad. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second word is Bina, right here. And Bina means understanding. Mm -hmm. So that's Chabad. And the D is da'at, which means knowledge in Hebrew. So here's your three letters, het, bet, dalet. And it's focusing on wisdom of the Torah, 
understanding it, and then applying it. And um, that's where you get the word Chabad. So now you know. Bina <laughs> is understanding. It also means to build. So when you, mm -hmm. when you get wisdom and you mm -hmm. begin to process it, you're building your knowledge. So these are all related in that sense. So they use additional literature called the Zohar. The Zohar is the foundational work in the Jewish mysticism called Kabbalah. Uh, mm -hmm. And they use a group of books, including commentary uh, on the mystical aspects of the Torah and scriptural interpretations as well as material on mysticism. They do a whole body-soul connection and it gets um, very mystical. Uh, you can read about it online if you want. Um, but I just wanted you to know what the Chabad was all about. And again, Harvey, on our break, if you have more to add, I would love it. Um, are you unmuted now, Harvey? You could add it now, perhaps. No, I, I think that's a good overview. There's not much to add. It might, it might okay. be important, though, uh, to understand that Orthodox Judaism uh, only makes up about 15% the total uh, Judaism worldwide. Um, so what we see in the United States mostly is uh, reform and conservative Judaism, okay. uh, even though uh, ultra-Orthodox Judaism is growing in this country. Uh, okay. Of course, in Israel, most of the country is secular, uh, and, uh, and and they wouldn't fall into any of the categories of Judaism. Yeah. yeah. And, and also I noticed that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, where there was a lot of uh, free thinking and spiritual stuff, um, I noticed a lot of Jewish people who were uh, not following Torah and weren't anything, they gravitated towards the New Age. And you'll mm -hmm. see a lot of Jewish people down in the self-realization uh, down yeah. in Encinitas, because they're looking for spiritual stuff, but, but they're not quite ready to be too religious, so that they gravitate toward either New Age or um, the self-realization. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, moving on. Um, Chabad was founded back in the 1700s by Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Russia. Um, the term Lubavitch is a Yiddish word. Uh, it's a name for the town in Russia which means brotherly love. And you can see the word love. Remember, we just looked at that. Lamed, bet, bet. There's the word love right there. Uh, and um, in 1951, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson became the seventh Rebbe of this Chabad Lubavitch group. And he transformed it into a small Hasidic movement, which today is found mainly in the United States and Israel. The word Hasidic comes from the word Hesed, which means devoted, pious, loving. We get the word loving kindness or compassion. Loving compassion is this word translated Hesed, and that's where you get Hasidic, the Hasidic mm -hmm. Jew. And Hesed is translated uh, here. Here is a picture of him, and this is where he's buried, and they come and they bring prayers to his grave and honor him as a great rabbi uh, of his day. You know, it might be interesting to note as well, more than just honoring Rabbi Schneerson or the Rebbe as, as just a great rabbi, he was hailed by the Lubavitch community, which by the way is uh, centered in Brooklyn, New York, not far from where I lived in Brooklyn, and that's where Rabbi Schneerson was until his death. He was hailed as the Messiah. Yeah. Uh, he, the Lubavitch uh, Chabad community uh, believed he was the anointed one. Uh, and then, of course, when he uh, died in, I believe, the 1990s, um, there was a great split in the Lubavitch community, mm -hmm. uh, some believing he was still the Messiah and would come back and others left the thought that he was actually the Messiah and uh, separate groups had formed uh, resulting from that. Did, didn't they also, Harvey, um, 
find it was it was he the one they found the note that said uh jesus was the messiah that he no, left no, no, behind no, no, Who no, is that, was, that was rabbi kaduri okay yeah i remembered one of them left some note okay rabbi kaduri was in israel rabbi schneerson i don't think ever even visited israel oh. he was in brooklyn huh okay well i wanted to show you this uh graphic pie graph here of how things have changed for the Jewish people over time. This is back in the 1880s and this was the population here in Europe and Russia was all the red. So this was, they were all over in Europe and Russia and very, very few in the United States at this point. This is when my grandfather came over. I found his name on the ship in the, oh. I went down to the, um, the Mormon a record thing downtown San Diego and spent a whole day there and I found a, a journal with my grandfather Leewald, Herman Leewald on one of the ships and it was pretty exciting but anyway uh, here it is in 2014 now look at the difference how how many Jews we have in the United States here and then look here Palestine and Israel here none <laughs> Hardly, mm -hmm. hardly any, if any, mm -hmm. in Israel. And then here, now look at all of them in Israel and in Palestinian region. And then very small uh, amount still in Europe and Russia. And then I have a more current slide that I pulled off today. And here's where the majority of them are. New York, look at 1,100,000. Jerusalem, half a million. LA, close behind, look at that. Jerusalem and mm -hmm. LA. And then Tel Aviv, San Francisco, Chicago, and then way down here you have Washington D.C. There's about 110,000 in Washington D.C. and uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, that's just kind of to see how the Jews have migrated and dispersed and been moved around, and um, it's such a blessing now to see them back in their homeland and thriving. This is kind of fun. I wanted to show you these words. What's this letter? Aleph. Okay. And if this comes at the beginning of a word, it means I will. Mm -hmm. And this is a bet, resh, aleph, and it's the word bara, to create. Uh -huh. this, is, this is the preposition ki, which means like, as, or according to. And this is the word for word. Da var, and it means a word or a thing or to speak. So I will create like a word. <laughs> okay. I have a quick question, Rebecca. Hold on one second. There it is. <laughs> Abara Kadabara came from the oh. Hebrew. I will create like I speak. <laughs> oh, Do you gosh. know that? No. That's funny. That's funny. Okay, and what was the question? Yeah, I had a question. If you can go back to the previous slide. Yes. Please. Thank you. Hi. Um, I had a question of um, Dabar. Yes. Uh, it looks like that B is a vet. Very good. There's no you, dot there. Am I yeah, correct? You're right. You're right. This should have been a V. It can be said either way, Devar or Debar, oh, okay. either one. Okay. But they, they don't match is what you're saying. And you're correct. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. There should be a, a dot in there, a dogish, if I'm mm -hmm. going to say Debar. Very good. Who was that? Nancy. Nancy. Yeah. Job. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the talit and the tzitzit. Um, Yeshua most likely wore a talit or a prayer shawl. And we see this reference in Matthew 9, 21, where it says, if only I could touch the hem, that word uh -huh. is kanaf, where the tzitzit would lie, of uh -huh. his garment. The garment, uh, a beged is a garment in Hebrew, but it's, it's, they're talking about his talit, his prayer shawl. Uh -huh. And they were saying, if only I could touch that, I'd be healed. Look in Matthew 14. It, it's not unusual that in the book of Matthew, that, that was a very Jewish uh, book of the four Gospels, Matthew is considered probably the original written in Hebrew for sure. 
um, but it would be Matthew that had the references here um, to the talit and the tzitzit. Um, and they begged him to let the sick touch the hem, kanaf, or where the tzitzit are, of his garment. And all who touched it were healed. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about that. Um, the talit has a crown called the atara. And it has the tzitzit, which are the little strings or tassels that you see hanging here. And here at the end of this large talit. And then here you can see the corners are a little longer. And uh, somebody trying to touch the hem of his garment or his talit. And in the Greek, it's uh, translated kraspadon. And kanaf means corner or hem. So when they're trying to touch the hem of his garment, they believed that power would come out if they could just touch the hem of his garment. Remember when Jesus said, who touched me? I felt power go out. This is what they were touching. The tzitzit comes from this verb tzit, tzit. And it means a budding or a flower or a wing. So imagine for a minute, Yeshua standing in the garden of Gethsemane with this talit over his head. And he's got his arms lifted up and he's praying. What do you think those talits look like? Bird feathers. Bird feathers. Wings, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you like a hen under her wing? I, I always picture him standing there in prayer and his talit looking like wings as he lifted his arms. Look at in Numbers 15, 37. This is the instruction that Hashem, God, gave to Moses. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, make for themselves tzitzit upon the corner, that's the word kanaf, of their clothes for generations, and on the tzitzit give a string of pechalet, which is blue. It's translated blue there. And then they said the reason of it is so that they would remember his mitzvot, his commandments, that they wouldn't stray in their hearts or in their eyes, that they would remain true to their God. And then it ends here with, I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Hashem, your God. So this blue part here is the very last part of the third part of the Shema that they say in the synagogue. They end the third part with this right here. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's where all that came from. And it says also in Deuteronomy 22, you shall make tassels on the four corners of your talit in which you cover yourself. So um, I find that beautiful. Today, most women uh, in Orthodox Judaism do not wear talits. Some of the more modern conservative uh, places have women that wear them. I saw some women in Israel at the Wailing Wall with them on. It kind of depends on where they are in their culture and tradition and which group you're talking about. Um, but what I'd like to do is just uh, show you a short video of uh, a young rabbi that we saw doing Hagba last week. And he's showing you how a Hebrew male would put on his talit. And I find this interesting. So I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna go back and reshare my other screen with him on it. And it's just three or four minutes, so let's watch it together. This is a, a good website if you wanna, this is an orthodox, myjewishlearning.com, you'll learn a lot on there. Um, but keep in mind, it's not messianic. So anyway, let's watch this together. The talit is a prayer shawl. You may own one, or you may pick one up off of the racks in the synagogue or prayer service that you attend. When you're ready to put on the talit, first drape it over your shoulder. You can now take the four fringes at the four corners that seat seat and take a look through them. Run your fingers through them just to make sure that they're straight and that each one has eight strings, four on each side, that they're complete and laying smooth. Now you're ready to put on the talit. Unfold it, looking for the atara, or crown, which marks the top side of the talit. Here it is. 
Hold the talit in front of you with the atara facing up and facing you and recite the blessing. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher kiddushanu mitzvotav Vitzivanu lihit atef vitzitzit The blessing describes wrapping yourself in the talit. And so before wearing it regularly, you actually wrap yourself in it. This is done in one of two ways. It begins by putting it on like a cape, turning it, turning it around behind you, and now you're ready. Now you're ready to put it, put it over, first your head, over your head. So the atara, the atara, around the crown, past your forehead. Past your forehead. Some people Some continue, people continue before, wearing before wearing it regularly, it regularly by gathering by the entire four, four sections, sections of the talit together and casting them over your left shoulder like so. Now you're ready to wear the talit regularly. Place the atara against the back of your neck. It's important that the four corners, the four tzitzit, lay against the four corners of your body, front left, front right, and back left and right. You accomplish this by bringing your hands out just past the corners and the tzitzit, giving yourself some wiggle room. Don't they look like wings? Lift up your arms, drape the back behind you comfortably, and bring the front corners in front of you. One, two, three, and four. Now you're ready with the atara against the back of your neck and the talit brought in against you, over your shoulders to wear the talit regularly for prayer. Looks like better go back and shut that off or it's gonna keep running, hold on. I'll probably get some new one now coming on. I hope not. All right. Hold on, people. I'm about to stop the sharing. Okay. What I love about watching that is when I always think about when Jesus said, you know, go into your prayer closet. I'm wondering if that's what he was talking about. What do you think, Harvey? Well, I don't know, but I think that's a good thought. Well, <laughs> I thought maybe it was, it was something that I just imagined, or maybe I heard it somewhere. But I would, the, when he put that over his head, and I sometimes when I put my prayer shawl on when I'm praying here in, in my office, I feel like I'm in a prayer closet, and that's what it feels like. And, I, and I'm like, that has to be where that came from. Um, covering your whole self, and that's where you pray. So, um, yeah, whether it is or isn't, I think they should do it just because <laughs> I said so. All right, so that's uh, the Talit, and let's go a little bit farther on that, just some more detail, which is fun. Um, some of the um, Talits are, have plain white, the Ashkenazi Jews, uh, I think this is correct, Harvey, uh, have plain white, and then the um, the Sephardic have the blue dye, the one long blue string in their tzitzit, and it comes from the snail. Now, this snail, this dye was a very special dye, and it was from the Tekelet snail. Uh, I think it's called a Corazon or something like that, Corazon snail, but this snail disappeared from Israel for 1,500 years, there's been no blue dye. It's only been in the past few years that this has reappeared in Israel, just in time to make some of the dye for uh, the temple that they're trying to build over there. And I'm thinking, isn't this interesting that this snail starts showing up again in Israel? Mm -hmm. But I wanted to show you there's two types of talits. There's a small one, katan means small. So um, this is like a little undergarment t-shirt that sometimes they wear with the tzitzit coming out and you can just see them like this guy here. This is a katan mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. And then this longer one is the talit gadol and it's the long one with the real long tzitzit. And remember in the New Testament when they said, oh, the, you know, you Pharisees love to wear the, everything extra long so you'll look more holy. 
Yeah, this yeah. is what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Look at in Matthew 23, O Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stone those sent to her, how I've longed to gather you like chicks under her kanaf. So mm -hmm. when he raised his hands in that demonstration, you could see how that looked like wings, didn't it? In mm -hmm. kanaf. Kanaf means wing or edge of the garment. They also have some numerical um, things mm. that they attribute to the tying of the knots and the twisting of the um, strings. S there's several different um, traditions. There's nothing in the Bible about this, but it, it just some of the rabbis have said, oh, look at the word seat seat. And if you give it all its numerical value, it adds up to 600. And if you add five knots and eight strings, you get 13. And now we've got a 613 commandments. So that was one of the theories about the tzitzit. And then um, it's also associated with number 39. And it has to do with the gematria um, of this phrase, Hashem Echad. So this is the tetragrammaton, yod He vav He, And this is the word Echad. So this is the Lord is one or God is one. And that adds up to 39. So they say, oh, it's, it signifies God's name. And it has to do with, again, the numbers of knots and strings and windings. Um, but also, it, they compare it to um, 39 being related to purification from any undesirable state. And it means the emergence of a new identity. And I thought, isn't that interesting that the rabbis say that because it was Yeshua who took 39 lashes on his back and we emerged with a new identity. So for me, that's what that points to. Um, and then I found this online. Here's some of the gematria of the seed and here's all the twisting See. Each tassel should have 39 windings and they add them all up. And then they say, look, 39 is the total. And then they relate that to the 39 lashes of the Messiah. And here's the tetragrammaton, the Lord is one. And uh, again, adding up to 39. So that's interesting. I like this crown idea. You know, when they Jesus rode into Jerusalem. I pictured people, you know what it said they throw they threw their cloaks down as he rode in. I picture them throwing their talits down and letting him walk across it. And to me, it would be like casting your crowns before the throne or the one who's king. Because this is called the crown. And remember in Revelation it says you'll cast their crowns before the throne. And I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if they're talking about this or if it'll be a literal crown that we'll get. Maybe we'll get our own personal talit. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think about that and think, oh, Lord, maybe they were casting their crowns symbolically before you when you rode into Jerusalem. So anyway, that was just a thought I had as I was studying so let's take a quick five minute break. It is um, 10 15. We've been going 45 minutes, and we'll take a little break, and uh, then we'll come back and actually do our four new letters, and uh, th then we'll call it a day. Mm. So we can unmute everybody. If some people want to just stay and chit chat, that's fine. Ask questions, comments. Anybody have any uh, comments? learning all this today. I have a question, but not about today's um, work. Uh, can I ask it? Yes. Who is this? I, I suppose that um, once you really know Hebrew, you know when you would use the different letters, you know, like you have the Yod and you have the I don't know, the Vav and the Vet, and you would know which Vs go where. Yes. I mean, that's just something you pick up eventually, I guess. 
Well, what, what you do, and I will be talking about this next week, I have several curriculum I'm going to be showing you next week, and you can have some options. Uh, once you get into the grammar and you start learning a vocabulary, like in, in one book I use, um, let me stop the share for a minute. In one of the very first, uh, one of the very first ones I went through was this one, ah. uh, Zola's Introduction to Hebrew, and it was my first attempt. And this took me a year, and I got this on uh, HebrewForChristian.com, and he wrote mm. our Torah book. Uh, Zola Levitt is uh, um, a Messianic believer, and he wrote this. Um, it's 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 quite thorough and you're gonna learn you're gonna learn uh, a lot of vocabulary but I'm I'm kind of disappointed in vocabulary using this I actually uh, learned more vocabulary using a different one and I'll show you that next week um, yeah I won't take any more time talking about that but but this was a fun one the only reason I wouldn't recommend this one is because they also teach you the cursive. And not only did I learn Hebrew, but then I learned the cursive. And then after I spent all that time, I'm like, I'm never going to use cursive. Why am I learning all this? So then I, I said, okay, well, I'll just learn the Hebrew. And then um, the next two times I went through a curriculum, it was with the uh, um, uh, Hebrew primer, and then I went through Gary Pratico's uh, book from Westminster, and that one is really, really hard, and mm -hmm. I still not through that. So my goal is to, to be farther down the road 10 years from now. So that's the question you ask yourself, where do I want to be in 10 years? I asked myself that when I first started on my 60th birthday. I said, I wonder where I'll be in 10 years. So here I am 11 years later, and I'm reading Hebrew, and I'm teaching it. And I'm like, who would have ever thought this little girl from Upper Michigan would be sitting here teaching a foreign language, and I'm not even that good at it. I'm just like, <laughs> no basics. But um, I know enough to teach other people basics. And, and it gives you that, that, that jump into this whole new kingdom of beautiful study that you don't get when you're just studying in a regular bible study i'm sorry but i've been in bible study for 44 <laughs> years and i just wanted more i kept saying lord there's got to be more and and then i heard billy graham say oh i regret i never learned hebrew and i went oh, that's what it is that's what i'm gonna do next and so i stopped all women's bible study i pulled out for a whole year and did this <laughs> and and so here I am 11 years later and I know a little bit more and I in 10 years from now I want to know even more uh, wonderful thank you we I appreciate it that's that's my journey <laughs> Rebecca it, yeah excuse me Judy Coors I have a question or at least for the week four assignment the homework assignment uh -huh. um, there was one it was section two where you have a dollar sign and an exclamation point okay. yes. <laughs> totally threw me for a loop i i don't understand it I didn't oh interesting <laughs> okay so it probably happened to what betsy had do you have pages judy pages? do i i do have pages but i i just printed out your um here's here's what happened homework. for those of you that have mac max with the, with the program pages you have to have the font do downloaded the hebrew font in order for you to print it out in pages oh uh, it's all just craziness okay. and betsy emailed me last night and said it's all just crazy and i went oh let's see what happened so that's what happened that's why i sent it out in pdf because everybody will then get just the hebrew they won't get the different fonts so if you got it last week with all that crazy stuff I need yeah. to resend it to you. So okay. if you will, if you okay, you did too. So just let me know, you guys. Send me a quick email, and I'll shoot it out to you in the PDF. Okay. And then yeah, in today's okay. uh, at the end of today's study, I do have the answers. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was learning another language. To be honest, <laughs> with you. Yeah, this is a dollar. It's a dollar.
<laughs> what in the world was this? Why did you guys email me, you silly goose? <laughs> okay. But it was a challenge. <laughs> Must have been quite a challenge. <laughs> All right. Well, I am going to continue on. I think people had at least a bathroom break or a drink break. And let's begin with our new letter, Sonic. And I'm going to, um, let's see, I need to get out of this, don't I? Yes. Let me share my screen and go into Sonic. All right. I got everybody there. All right, now Samic is pretty easy when it comes to uh, remembering the Samic. It's, I just think of when I draw it, I just think of circle, circle, it's the S sound. So when I see a circle with a little flame up here, I think circle Samic. And uh, Samic means to support or a prop. Its ancient symbol is down here. Um, when the high priest at the Day of Atonement lays his hands on the uh, goat to uh, transfer the sin onto the goat, it's called samicha, and it comes from this word to support. And so the laying on of hands is saying now, now this goat is going to support or carry all the sin. And that, that process is called samecha, and it comes from this word. So the nuance is to aid or assist or defend. Uh, you'll see this word show up with that kind of a nuance. It's number 60 in the gematria. And let's look at some fun words. Let me get out of this little annotation thing. And let's look at some words that start with samic. Samic is called a sibilant. And um, let me get rid of my scribble here. All right, so a sibilant is the S sound. It goes through your teeth. Um, and its ancient symbol was a thorn. Uh, animals used to hide in thorn bushes because it protected them. So it has a meaning of, of surrounding for protection as well. Uh, the laying on of hands I already told you about. So we get the word um, sedur or seder from uh, the first letter is a samic. And seder means order. So when you have a Passover seder, it's the word order. And it starts with samic, dalit, and resh. Look at the word for forgive, salach, salach. Salak means to progress forward. Now think about that. The word forgive means to progress someone forward. It means also um, to forgive. So one of the teachings of Adam and Eve covering, God covering their shame when he set them out of the garden, it's like when you covered them, so that you can progress them forward. In other words, he covers their shame so that when they're brought back, they're forgiven and there's no shame. So you can see how it would progress somebody forward to cover them and bless them. Let, let's say you were gonna um, get divorced or let's say you and a best friend had this misunderstanding and you, you went your parting ways. You will have to remember to cover them like God covered Adam and Eve. Cover them with words of life. Speak life to them. Speak a uh, blessing. Even though we're parting, I bless you. I'll pray for you. I, I, I don't want this separation, but I will bless you instead of curse you. And that way you've covered the shame. And so that when they repent, if they repent and come back to you, they can come back with a clear conscience because you've blessed them when you've sent them away. So look at the word for, it's a related word, salak, shalak, they're sound alikes. This means to send away or to send out. And this is where shaliach is one of the disciples. A shaliach is another name for a sent out one. So shaliach, talmudim are disciples, Jesus' disciples or sent out ones. 
So we're to be sent out with forgiving hearts. See how this all, th these are just so fun to look at, sound alike words, and then see a connection between them. It's just beautiful. I keep these in a book called My Jewish Jewels. And when I come across these kind of words, I put them in my special book. Look at the word to hide, sitar. Starts with a samic, and it means to shut up or to hide something. It also means secret. If you put a mem on the front of this, you get the word mistar, which means secret. We get our English, English word mystery. See? M S T R. Mistar means secret and mystery in English. And look at the word treasure, segal. And that's what uh, God calls his people, his am segola, or his treasured people. That's the word uh, segal. And it's number 60, like I said. There's very few words that start with uh, samic. It's one of the... Um, it's one of the least prolific letters in Hebrew. Um, so let's go to the next one, ayin. Now, how do I remember ayin? I'll show you how to remember ayin. This is a fun way. So ayin, think of uh, the ayin drawn like a, kind of like a Y. And then you draw these little faces. And there's two little guys here. And they're eyeing each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I see the iron, I'm thinking of their iron each other. And whenever I see this form, I go, oh, yeah, that's the iron. And what's funny, its ancient symbol was an eye. And iron in Hebrew also means an eye or a well or a spring. Because if God was looking down into a well, it would look, they, they called it in ancient times the eye of the earth because it's clear and you can see a reflection. So it's the word for well or a spring. And same for eye. And the nuance when you see a word with ion in it has something to do with vision or understanding or seeing. Um, what do we say when we understand something? Oh, I see, right? Mm -hmm. I understand, I see, and so I see the connection with this word in some sort of understanding or vision when you see it in a word. Now let's look at a few of the words and see if you can see it for yourself. That I'm not crazy when I say these things. You really do start to notice um, yourself when you start looking at these words. Let me clear this. Clear all drawings. Let's look at some words with, go away, wait. <laughs> okay. I'm blowing my fingers. They get sweaty and hot in here, and then I can't move my screen. Um, hold on. The first word is avar. Avar, or abar as a verb, uh, means to cross over. And Abraham was the first person to cross over. And you can see a bar is in his name, Abram, see it, mm. A-B-R. Mm. Even though it's spelled different, it's, it's related in that he was the first to cross over. And we get the um, word Eber to cross over from that. See, here's Eber. And that's where you get the word Hebrew from, from the mm. word to cross over. So mm -hmm. it means to go from one place to a better place. So the idea is when you cross over, you're going to something new. Isn't that what God said to Abraham? Leave mm -hmm. your old behind and cross over to a land I'll show you. He had no idea where he was going. But mm -hmm. out of obedience, he was the father of our faith. And he was willing to cross over and go where he didn't understand God was taking him. I can really relate to that. When I did my first year of Hebrew, I ordered uh, 45 CDs from uh, a ministry, and they took me through the first six chapters of Hebrew in every word of Hebrew. I didn't know one letter. It took me a year, 45 CDs later, and a year later, the day I finished, I finished in the sixth chapter of 
uh, Genesis, the last thing I learned with those 45 CDs was, and Noah did everything God asked him to do, and he found favor in, Noah, in God's eyes. I closed the, the book for the 45 CDs, and I go, wow, I finished all 45 CDs. Big deal. No one cares. My husband doesn't care. My kids don't care. Who cares? And all of a sudden, the Lord said, I care. Uh. I care. And my husband called me on the phone, and I'm not making this up. He said, run outside, quick. So I ran outside in my pajamas, and there was the largest double rainbow they had seen in San Diego. It was on the news that night. And I went, oh, he cares. I spent a whole year slugging through this, struggling. Anyway, sometimes he takes us to places we don't understand why. But I look back now, 11 years ago, and I go, oh, I get it. <laughs> I get it now, Lord. You were taking me somewhere, even though I didn't understand. So I relate to that word. And then look at this word, arav. It, all you do is change these two letters. Look, the bet and resh, you change them. So these two are going to be related somehow. Now look, Abraham went, he went somewhere where he was leaving his homeland. He actually went west. And this is the word for west, or it means to mix or mingle. Erev is the word for evening, and it's also the word for west. The sun sets in the west because there's a mixing of light, day and light. And you can see how that word means to mix. And so that's why in the east, they say the westerners are the ones that are liberal and crazy. And I'm like, yep, here we are in California <laughs> on the west coast where we're all mixed up together. Um, Anyway, my husband gets offended when I say that because he's from here. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it is the word for Arab or evening. Uh, witness starts with an ayan, edda. So a witness sees from a different perspective, don't they? And it's the word for witness, the door to understanding, basically. See, a witness gives you um, more information so that we understand and we say, oh, I see, or I understand. Mm -hmm. Then look at this word, olam, starts with an ayin. It means, olam means to hide. And we get the word alma from here, and that's for a young virgin, because she's hidden away until she's mature. And it's also the word for secret, because it implies something that it's unknown. So something that's eternal, is related to something hidden or secret or unknown. And that's the olam or the eternal. It, it's interesting. In Hebrew, your past is in front of you and your future is behind you. Hmm. It's the opposite. Because we already know our past, it's in front of our eyes. The future is behind us. In other words, unseen. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's mm -hmm. just the opposite. Look at how um, in this scripture, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. This is the Shema. And look, they have an enlarged ayin and an enlarged dalet in the scripture. And it's the word for witness. So we are his witnesses. Isn't that beautiful? I want to tell you a funny story. I'm going to get out of here for a minute. This is a true story. When I learned the letter iron, um, it meant to see. And so that morning I was out in my front yard and a woman drove up in a van and she said, oh, Rebecca, I've been looking for you. I didn't know where your address was, but I knew you were in this neighborhood. And I thought, well, I'll just drive around and around. And there you are standing in your front yard. And I'm like, that is weird. So she <laughs> said, Remember me, I was at your house five years ago, and you had that candle ministry at Christmas, and you were handing out candles and putting gospel tracts in them, and where did you get the gospel tracts? I said, well, I get them in a ministry called pocketpower.org, 
she said, oh, I want to buy some of those and give them to somebody. I said, oh my gosh, I just ordered 30 of them. You can have them. Come on in. So she comes in my house. I give her a box of 30 of these gospel tracts of John. I said, who are you going to give them to? She said, well, my husband met, met this guy at the beach. He was living out of his van, and he was sharing the gospel with people. And my husband got up talking to him for three hours, and this kid left everything to share the gospel with people out of his van. So my husband collects uh, Volkswagen vans, and he said, let me buy this van from you, and I'll buy you a better van. You need something bigger. And the guy, he goes, come home with me. So the guy followed him home. He goes to our church. The guy follows this guy home and he gets online with him and they look online. And he finds an old school bus in Chula Vista. They drive to Chula Vista and he buys him a school bus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this, this woman is married to the guy, and she wants to give him the gospel tracts of John to hand out out of his new school bus. So I'm like, I have got to meet this guy. What's his name? His name is Chad. Okay, where, where does he live? Up in La Costa. Okay, I'm going to get in my car and follow you. So I follow him home. I get up there and they're in this beautiful house, these gates open, I go down the driveway and here's this kid standing down there with his old beat up Volkswagen and a school bus. So I go running down there and I'm talking miles an hour. I'm going, oh, hi, Chad, you know, my name is Rebecca. Oh, that's so wonderful, you're handing out. And he's just staring at me real quietly. <clears throat> and I go, hi, my name's Rebecca. And I hold out my hands to take his hands and he said, my name is Baruch. I go, Baruch, I thought your name was Chad. And Maria goes, I thought your name was Chad. He goes, well, that's my name I tell everybody, but I'm Jewish and my real name is Baruch. I go, oh, I'm learning Jewish. I mean, I'm learning Hebrew. And then I'm like, blah, 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 blah. Now I'm, you know, how did you start this? And how did you get saved? And every time I asked him a question, he'd stop and just stare at me. <laughs> then he would give me a scripture and then he would answer my question I thought that is so odd I've never met anybody like that so I went back home after meeting Baruch seeing him answer my questions with first God's word and then an answer the next letter the next day I was to learn was pay which is the symbol of the mouth. <laughs> so I am sitting there going, oh my goodness, Lord, I get it. You first have to see, let the spirit speak and then respond. That's why the iron comes before the pay. What are the odds I would meet somebody that would demonstrate this to me the same day? Okay. So I want to go back to my screen now, and I want to show you. I had to take his picture that day. Here he <laughs> is. <laughs> Isn't that great? This is the guy that goes to our church. This is his remodeled school bus, and here he's standing here with his Tanakh, and this is Baruch. So that's my story. Isn't it fantastic? Yes. So here's the pay, the mouth. All right. So pay has several forms it can be the letter p or the letter f this is the one without the dot now let me show you how you remember this guy let me draw it so if you're going to remember pay think of this as a profile mm -hmm. with a little i and i think oh profile that's the letter p or pay see Kind of looks like a side view of a profile, doesn't it? So when you don't see the eye, he's a fake. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's a F instead of a profile, it's a fake. So it reminds me of the letter F, okay? Or some people say faceless without the eye. 
So that's how you can remember that one. This is another letter like uh, Kof Mem Nun that has an, a final form or a sofit, and this is the Pe or Fe sofit. And this is always at the end of a word. So when you see it with the beginning of the profile but goes way down below the line, then here's the line, then you know it is F sound and it's always at the end of the um, word, all right? So it's the mouth in its ancient form. It has something to do with teaching or preaching or to open. Um, and I'm gonna show you words that have a P in them that have something to do with that. And you'll see what I mean when I say that they have something to do with opening or speaking or teaching or something like that. So I noticed that everything that has a P and an R in it has something to do with fruitfulness. Let me show you some of the words. Sorry, my fingers are sticky. Um, some of the words here. Um, you know what I probably should use is some baby powder or something on my fingers. Uh, anyway, uh, let me show you the first root word, parar or para. It means to flourish or produce in its ancient form. We get the word um, Ephraim, which means fruitful, Ephraim in Hebrew. It has the P and the R, Ephraim or F-R. To flourish, you see the, the F and the R, flourish, Ephraim, fruit, P-R is fruit, produce. So I just noticed that also the bull is called a par because he produces offspring. And a bull is a par. He hmm. produces. Then I noticed also to break out is parash or to seek or separate out. And it has the PR again. So when you're seeking out or dividing out or trying to sort out, you see the word PR again, parash. That's where we get the parasha in our Torah study because it's, it's seeking out more meaning. A parasha is to seek out meaning. You might get the word in English, peruse, to seek out. Persia, Farsi, also I noticed has the P and the R. Persia, P and the R. Um, look at Pharaoh. It has the, the P and the R. Paro is Pharaoh. And it means to loosen or disarrange, distance, or king with unlimited power. <sighs> Blossom. Para. Para. So something that blossoms forth is what happens when it's producing. A tree blossoms forth and produces fruit. So look at how they're related. Para, parach, to seek out, parash. Uh, and then look at this word, penetrate, palash. We get the word Philistine from that. And it means to penetrate. Hmm. Palestine comes from the word palash, same root. Palestine, Philistine. Here's some other examples in English of the PR combination, meaning produce, producing fruit or produce. PR is in the bull. I notice fru, fru, when things come to fruition, they come to their fruitfulness, right? Fruition. Look at pure, puree, puree mm. fruit, another PR. How about farm? <laughs> produce has the PR in it. Parent, a parent. Um, it's just interesting. Uh, I have a book called um, Edenics, and it's written by a Jewish man. And Edenics is takes all these words back and shows you different languages and how they cross over from language to language. And that's when I started paying attention to these pairs of letters, like the B and the L and the P and the R. And, uh, and the um, anyway, 
I find it fascinating. Now I've become like this word nerd who loves to find these little clues in these languages. Maybe you could care less, but I find it fascinating. Look at the P here. When you make a P, pay, there's another letter inside of it. Do you see that? What letter is that? Uh, it's not mem. No. no. Back porch, but no dot. Oh, oh. vet. It's a vet. It's a vet oh. inside the pay. Uh -huh. um, and I, was, I was remembering that little scribe when she said her favorite letter was the pay because she could see another letter inside of it. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to look that up. So I just thought that was. Uh -huh. All right, our last letter, and we're almost done. Everybody, we got about 10 more minutes. So everybody hang in there. Let's look at the Saudi. And let me show you how you can remember little Saudi by drawing. And here's what I do to remember him. Remember how I said iron is the two iron each other? Well, mm -hmm. this one has got his back turned on this one. So imagine two people. This one's got his back turned to this guy. And they're both looking this way. And this guy here is trying to get his attention. And he's going, <laughs> <laughs> and I always think of that. Oh, yeah, it's Saudi. Now, I know that's kind of silly, but when you see this, you're going to think of the little guy going, tss, tss, and you'll <laughs> Saudi. Saudi kind of looks like a backward Z, and then you put a little line going like so. So think of it like Z goes like this, doesn't it? Oops, hard to draw with this. This is your Z. So it kind of looks like part of a Z. And then you take this and you just stick it there instead. And that's how you learn to draw your letters. That's pretty easy, right? So this, this letter has really changed over time. This is its early form. Uh, they said it was a man on its side. And then it said, no, it started looking like a fish hook. And then it transformed into this letter. So you can see it's almost like he stood this guy up. And now he looks like this. <laughs> and then he looks like that. So... When you look up the ancient letters, you'll say, one of them will say fish hook, because they're talking about this period. Another will say a man on its side. This is the earliest. So anyway, um, it has a gematria of 90. So it's uh, letter 90 in Hebrew. And let's look at some words that uh, start with Saudi, some wonderful words in Hebrew. And let's see if I can enlarge this. Yay! Look at the word zelim. It means an image. Uh, this is one of my favorite words. And I have another fun story, if you don't mind. Um, when I learned this word zel, it means zelim, image. And then I, w I noticed a related word was shadow, zel. So mm -hmm. I went, okay, then here's another word. Zela means from your side. So Eve was taken from Adam's side. So it's related somehow to being in his image or shadowing him in some way, similar but different, just like a shadow. And I'm like, oh my gosh, all these are sort of related. This is amazing. And then I looked up the word mazel, and it meant in the shadow of or deep, deep darkness. So I go to the gym, I'm running on the treadmill, I look down and there's this man, I'm gonna come out of here a minute. He's running as fast as he can. And I'm going, oh my gosh, he's gonna fall down and then I gotta go help him. And, and he's <laughs> running back and forth behind me, back and forth, back and forth. And the, the third or fourth time, I looked at the back of his shirt and it had three Hebrew letters, Mem, Saudi, Lamed. And I had just learned that word that morning. I thought, what are the odds that I'd be at the gym and see Mazel on somebody's shirt? So I had to go talk to him. So I went down there and he's got his headphones on. And I said, excuse me. And he took his headphones off. I said, you have Mazel on the back of your shirt. Why? He, are you from Israel? He had this heavy accent. He said, yes, I'm from Israel. I go, oh, I'm learning Hebrew. I just learned that word this morning, Mazel. What does it mean? 
He said, well, I was a lifeguard in Israel. <gasps> I go, that makes such sense. They rescue you out of the deep or out of the shadow of darkness. Look at that beautiful word. Oh my goodness, this is another word I stuck in my special book because to me, it was so meaningful. So let me go back to the screen now. God keeps doing this to me. The day I study something, he gives me a way to use it that blows my mind. So here's the word for shadow, deep darkness, and it's lifeguard in Israel. And it's also, by the way, the name for a, a rescue service in Israel using this word. So um, I'll show it to you in a minute. And look, tzitzit starts with zadi, vav, zadi. It's the word for tzitzit, which means to blossom forth or fringes. You can read all this later. Um, let me show you this page two here of this. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but here's the word zadik. Zadak, which means righteousness or justice. And <clears throat> we have the king of righteousness. Remember, Malki Zadik. Mm. Malach is king and Zadik is righteous. Here's the word. So king of righteousness. I was thinking, I wonder if Neil Sadaka. <laughs> and that was his name. Zadika. See, Sadak. Mm. It's right there. I have to look that up. Okay, look at the word for uh, a command or a mitzvah. Here's the word sava, which means to delegate authority. And we put a mem on the front and we get mitzvah or commandment. So the mem on the front of a word is the means by which you carry out a command. So the means by which you do that is a mitzvah. Okay. Here's the word shadow, mazel, and here's the rescue service in Israel. Isaiah used part of that word, hitzil, to describe how God rescues his holy city, Jerusalem. And it shows up in the scripture in Isaiah 31, 5. You can look that up in your blue letter Bible, can't you? And find this word. And so here it is down here, hitzil. Look at you, you know your Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sadi, Yod, Lamed. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> and what's this word? Passover. Uh, Passover. Passover. Mm -hmm. Pesach. See it here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in Israel, um, the rescue service in Israel is called Hatzalah. Hatzala. It comes from Zel, and it means to rescue. So the United Hatzala volunteers provide the nation of Israel with rapid professional pre-ambulance emergency care. And we see that word Zel in there, to rescue. Next time you read your scripture and you're reading about um, he rescues me from the shadow of darkness. You can just see that lifeguard reaching into the deep, deep place that you're in and lovingly pulling you out of the darkness. That's a beautiful word picture. Look at this. I love this. I found it online. This is your Zadi, and it shows a little man. Here he is in this world, humble, but in the new world, we're going to stand before uh -huh. him with arms raised. So it's like the Saudi and then the final Saudi. I love that. And then look at this. When Sarah found out she was pregnant, she laughed, right? Look mm -hmm. at the word for laugh in Hebrew. Okay. Zechak, Zechak. It's where you get Yitzhak, Isaac, right? That's his name. The Saudi is 90 in Hebrew. The Het, is number eight, and Abraham, the Kof, was 100 years old. Wow. Sarah was 90, Abraham wow. was 100, and wow. he had a new beginning, and his name was Yitzhak, to laugh. Pretty cool, huh? Uh-huh. Okay, well, that was a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that.
I hope that you will take some time to go through these words on your own. <laughs> Thank you for clapping, Eloise, I see you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hope you love this as much as I do and that you're uh, excited to think of yourself 10 years from now, reading and finding these old treasures, these little nuggets of connections all through the scripture. And you'll never read your Bible the same once you start learning this language, right girls? You alumni mm -hmm. who've been through this class five, six, seven times, uh, you mm -hmm. get better and better every cycle. So hang in there. We only have one more class. And God bless you all. And have a great week. I'll see you next time. And please watch me on, um, I'm going to unmute you in a minute because I want to show you something before we leave. I get a uh, bi-monthly order of olive oil from the Galilee in Israel. And it's called Ooh. Galilee Green. And it comes in this wonderful um, container in gift packages. And it comes <laughs> with a beautiful glass decanter. And um, you can follow Galilee Green online. And this guy who owns this company does a walking tour all around Israel. So it's fascinating mm -hmm. to follow him on uh, Galilee Green. And I just got two of these in the mail, and I'm so excited. It's, this is so light, this olive oil. Um, mm. When you hold it up next to my olive oil from Trader Joe's, it's kind of a golden, dark color. And then you hold this up, and it's clear decanter. It's this light, 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 light yellow. And mm. I told my husband, that's your olive oil. This is my olive oil. <laughs> he goes, oh, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of your olive oil. So only on his birthday can he have my olive oil. Because, heck, I paid 20 bucks for this. And I'm like, it's my precious olive oil. <laughs> Don't dump it in the frying pan when you're cooking. Anyway, I wanted to tell you about Galilee Green. It supports a, a family business in Israel. If you want to do that, it's 10 bucks a month. So anyway, I just got one in the mail. I wanted to show that to you. And the other thing I wanted to show you was what? What, what, what was it? Um, oh, go to Sparky's Tour Time on YouTube and follow me this last teaching on Bahar and Beku Tai. Behuchotai, sorry. It's got a lot of Hebrew in it, and it'll be fun to see how I incorporate the Hebrew into the Torah study, because my goal in teaching these beginning Hebrew classes is to continue to add the, the, you know, the words in the Torah study so that people who have taken this class can then go there and make their own connections and see the Hebrew uh, in Torah study and why it's so much fun. So um follow me like me and follow me share me on facebook and um it's on instagram i think i need to learn how to do that better but anyway <laughs> it's on youtube for sure and on facebook sparky's torah time i post it every week so shalom aleichem and we'll see you next week god bless you